Hello. Welcome to Books and Brews. The place where beer and literature meet. With your host, certified Cicerone, Michael Agnew. And Laura Mosica, author of The Blue Bells Chronicles. Each month we invite a guest author to read their words and talk about writing while sipping beers specially paired with their work. Today's guests are Loretta and Michael Kehoe. So sit back, pop a cold one, and dive into some books, and brews. I think we got it right. Okay, so we are starting. We are in. Welcome to episode 20... 21. 21 of Books and Brews. Right. We long ago lost track of how many COVID episodes we're in, too. Is it seven? Yeah, or I have no idea. COVID. Yeah, we, we just quit caring. <laughs> March, and come March, we'll be in a year, so. Uh, yes. Wow, cool. That's right. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we must be like eight or nine, something like that. So, uh, you know, apart from COVID, <laughs> how's your month been? My month has been uneventful. Uh, because I don't do anything these days. It's a slow work time. Um, and I go grocery shopping. I cook. I play my banjo. Yeah, that's right. Like fun. I'm teaching myself to play banjo. I got one for Christmas last year, and uh-huh. I'm not very good. But I can play three songs now. Three songs is three songs. Right. Uh, boil them cabbage down. Mm-hmm. Uh, Shady Grove and Worried Man Blues, <laughs> which I thought, which I thought were like, uh, you know, just because I'm working with this book that comes with a CD and a DVD to kind of teach you how to do things, and I thought it was just songs, you know, that they made up for this book to mm-hmm. teach you some basic stuff but no these are all like staples standards of american folk music like uh boil them cabbage down his roots uh started as a slave song and it's been recorded hundreds of times Mm -hmm. wow these are actual real songs are you a steve martin fan uh i am not but i have heard him play banjo and he's good why because he he goes like he's like you know, you, you can't be depressed playing a banjo. He's like, it's always fun. So he's it's true. It is fun. Yeah. It's, it's a, <laughs> Even when you're not very good, it's fun. He's got a, he's got a little routine he does. He's like, he's played a little banjo, you know, like death and, you know, and sorrow, and despair. It's just, it just doesn't work. So anyway, look, look yeah. up this little bit on the banjo. It's funny. So. I, I like that theory. I have a similar theory about harp that you can trip over a harp and it still sounds beautiful. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where, where Although I feel bad for my neighbor, uh, even with the windows closed, a banjo is such a loud instrument. Really? That he can hear it. Wow. Well, <laughs> see, I'm coming from the world of trombones, so I wouldn't have expected. Exactly. Yeah. No, banjos I learned when I started playing are crazy loud. I, I'm going to have to hear you play someday. You're going to have to break it out at one of our Books and Brews interviews and play Yeah, that. well, we'll see about that. I, re- I closed us out once. I, I played the closing music in a couple of episodes. I'll, I'll need to, I, I don't know if I heard that. I'll need to go I'll, back. You should go back. I don't remember which episodes they were, though. Oh, I'll have to listen to the end of each one of them. Well, um, I kind of envy you because I have spent my month packing up uh, a household that previously included 11 people and multiple pets. Mm-hmm. Um, of the six kids who are living me, with me, one is kind of moved in with his fiance. The other five moved in with their dad. I've moved into an apartment and now I'm purging everything that's left, sorting and cleaning and packing to get the house on market. So if anybody wants a six bedroom house <laughs> for sale, lots of music in those walls. And uh, it has been a crazy, busy month. <laughs> and thus your brain deadness. Yes, yes, I did mention I'm kind of brain dead. So if I say anything stupid, please, everyone pretend that, you know, it was really it. wise and witty and you just didn't get it because I'm that wise and witty, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, are you reading anything? I'm going to guess maybe not. Um, I am not reading anything. Um, 
because I've said the past two months, the titles of all the books, because I've got like probably two or 3,000 books in that house and a lot of them will some tab price books. And I'm, I'm keeping all my books on medieval history and music, of course. Um, but I did start writing today again. So I said, kind of the story of this house and, and this interesting question of how we end up in the houses we do and how those houses impact us and affect us. And there is this kind of an interesting story behind why we're in this house, which was never ever the right house for my life. Um, but there's a story behind there. And I, th I think that's kind of, um, well, let's say therapeutic too, to start writing that out and getting at um, just, you know, the good and the bad and the happiness and all the things that have happened in that house. And why I didn't want to be there, but, you know, you, you try and make the best of where you are. So um, writing, but not reading. Yeah. yeah. How about you? I am prepping to start reading. Let's say that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I am currently listening to lectures that are introductory to what I want to start reading. Oh, interesting. Um, so I am not religious, but I have always found religion very fascinating. Um, and I have long wanted to read the Gnostic Gospels. Oh, interesting. Okay. And so that's what I'm going to dig into. Uh, and uh, there's a Naj Hammadi library website that has all of the Gospels and a whole bunch of support materials to the Gnostic Gospels. And so I'm listening to a series of lectures now that kind of introduce the main concepts Very interesting. of the Gnostic Gospels. I've, I've heard all my life about the Gnostic Gospels. I think I know what they are, but go ahead and tell me or tell us. Yeah, so it's in the early Christian church, the first couple hundred years, there were multiple competing like kinds of Christianity, multiple interpretations, schools of Christianity. Uh, and then ultimately the Orthodox won out and kind of stamped everyone else out, mm -hmm. like actually repressed them and destroyed their documents. Okay. Um, and the Gnostics were one of the others. So basically the Gnostic way of viewing Christianity is more akin to like Buddhism, if you will. Okay. Uh, in fact, they see the Buddha as a prophet, or not even a prophet, like a like a Messiah figure, mm -hmm. um, in that it is about a personal uh, transcendent experiment experience of uh, the God, whatever whatever they want to call it. Okay. Um, as opposed to so, as opposed to like. The, the Orthodox, which set up the hierarchy of priests and whatnot, where you enter through that, and it's a, it's a belief rather than an experience, if you will. It should be very interesting, and it sounds like it's a fairly brand new topic to you. It is. I mean, I've, I've glanced at them, but mm -hmm. uh, I've always wanted to really dig in and read them. Okay. So I'm going to, with all this time that I've got doing nothing. <laughs> You've got time on your hands. Yeah. Well, uh, so Who are our guests? Our guests today, we actually have two. And we have Lori and Michael Kehoe from Las Vegas. Woo <laughs> That's the so, one good thing about COVID. It allows us to bring in people from other places. Yes. I, I've, I've really been enjoying this, uh, doing it by Zoom. I mean, I miss doing it in person because that's fun too. But I, I like parts of the Zoom. So Lori is an avid reader of all types of books, but mostly science fiction and fantasy, seeking in these stories reflections of her Christian faith. Not finding many, she decided to write what she wanted to read. Her husband, Michael, is a professional comedian, actor, and screenwriter. In addition to his geriatric Elvis performances in the Las Vegas area, he has appeared in several movies, including the latest Jason Bourne film and Godzilla sequel. He added his input to her book, and that book became A Dream of Dragons. They have also published stories in several anthologies. After raising five children in Chicago, they moved to Las Vegas, Nevada, where they live with their two cats, Thor and Sammy. 
Did I mention my dog is with my ex-husband? <laughs> I, just speaking of pets, I find it kind of funny. The kids are telling me how they're taking her to, they're living in a small town now instead of a suburb, and how they're taking her to the local store where they buy her pet food. And, a cur- and they said everybody just loves her. And I asked, do they think it's odd that, you know, you guys, that their new neighbor has his ex-wife's dog? <laughs> Nobody's actually aware of that because they only see the kids, I guess, with the dog. But but they're having fun with her. So anyway, I kind of miss my dog. <laughs> so, Michael, what is our first beer today? Our first beer um, to go with this first reading. Uh, so there are multiple ways that I approach pairings. Uh, and sometimes it's as simple as a name. Uh, and that is the case with this one. Uh, and this will become clear once you do the reading. Uh, but the beer is from New Holland Brewing in oh, Michigan, nice. and it is called Dragon's Milk. Oh, okay. Uh, this uh, is an old school bourbon barrel aged uh, imperial stout. Um, it's been around forever and ever. So now everybody, anybody makes bourbon barrel aged this, that, and the other. But uh, Dragon's Milk is an early one. It's been around for a really long time, and it's also a very, very good one. Um, uh, you're, you'll probably really like this, Laura. Okay, uh, it's a it little coffee, and some really great vanilla notes in there from the bourbon barrel. Really good. Okay, well, I know you told me that I'm never ever to drink beer cold. But um, this teaching by Skype is really killing my throat. So if you see me guzzling the whole thing, you know, it's... Uh... <laughs> and bear in mind, it is 9% alcohol. Hey, the, okay. the more you drink, the better we sound. 12%, I'm sorry. <laughs> my, 11% my, alcohol. It is 11, 11%. 11%. My throat it won't guzzle too much. By the end of this interview, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cheers. 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 <laughs> and uh, give it a go there, Laura. All right. Okay. I am flying. I inhale a deep breath of... Oh, goodness. We have two Lauras here. We have two Lauras. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) This actually is like the first episode we ever did where it was Laura, Laura, Michael, and Michael. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Did you want her to start or were you talking that? All right. Before you start, Laura, uh, (laughs) Laura, did you like this beer? I love this bear. You picked a winner in my book. All right. <laughs> um, you're probably going to disappear while you're reading Lori to put ice in this because, like I said, this uh, teaching by Skype is killing my throat. <laughs> Anesthetic every night. All right. So uh, go ahead and start the reading. All right. Okay. I am flying. I inhale a deep breath of sweet morning air and glide effortlessly on the strong, swift current. I close my eyes and enjoy the cool wind against my face, soaring over majestic crystal mountains. Their sparkling summits of breathtaking color stretch beyond the distant horizon, reaching up to a silver sky under a brilliant white sun. Far beneath me, an ocean of emerald green laps at the side of the mountains and crests white whenever the water slams against the lower outcroppings. Sharing the sky with me is an enormous dragon with powerful great white wings. He is the largest of all the dragons except for the two. His massive wingspan is as wide as he is long. His strong pectoral muscles flex to propel him high up into the clouds, his wings beating the air. I struggle to keep up, following him to the highest peak, which has a flattened top. Numerous multi-level structures made of bricks hewn from the crystal mountain extend out, shimmering with different colors. Each shelf leads to a dragon's lair. The higher the dwelling, the higher one's status in our world. Dragons soar on and off their perch on the mountain. Their bodies are long and slim. Three glowing, flowing fins grace their tails, the same color as their wings. Their faces are elongated with ears that sweep up to sharp points and turn in the direction of even the slightest sound. Their mouths are the lengths of their heads with two thin slits for nostrils. Our smooth golden skin glimmers in the sunlight. The membrane covering our wings varies in color and brightness. 
Some have wings of dark gray, lighter gray, silver, dark blue, light blue, yellow, red, purple, and white. My iridescent wings reflect all of the, of the colors of the other dragons. A deafening crack of thunder shakes the mountains. The sky is torn open with a sickening black flash. Out of the wound, several large ebony dragons come gushing through the severed jugular of the heavens. Black wings span twice the length of their bodies. They crash down. The mountain quakes under their feet. Razor sharp claws slice, slice the pristine crystal beneath them like flesh. I tremble from the horror before me. Fire spews from their great mouths, scorching the crystal mountain and its frightened inhabitants. Their nostrils are raised and large and emitting smoke from the deadly furnace within. Their evil eyes blaze as red as the flames they expel, mercilessly burning the golden dragons attempting to flee. I want to help to fight the attackers, but I am thrown to the ground where sharp claws hold me. I scream, helplessly witnessing this hellish genocide, Inferno incinerating my kind. This is an interesting first scene that you because it is a dream in a sense. And, you know, the, the typical advice on writing is you can't write dreams, you know, because then the, the reader is disappointed. Um, but this is a dream that has to happen. And it's very, mm -hmm. tell, tell our uh, 50 million listeners, what is the premise of this book? The premise of this book is um, and, well, and the story. I'm sorry? And who is dreaming? Okay, the premise of this story is that a man named Henry Williford finds a naked girl on the beach in Florida who is like a newborn. She can't talk, walk, or anything. And he takes her in and to take care of her. And she learns very quickly and he starts to take care of her. But every night, She's having dreams of dragons, of these beautiful golden dragons that soon become dreams of death and fire and what you heard. So Anne is her name and Anne is the one who is dreaming. And this is happening every single night. She has no memory of her life before. The only thing she knows is these dreams that happen every night. Mm -hmm. You should hold up your, your book cover. I see the books right behind you. And um, this is actually a second printing of this book. And I was just amazed when you found this cover. And I, I published this book, you know, so I have some kind of insight or input on that side. And normally I'd say, yeah, that's a little, you know, almost provocative for what I as a fairly conservative sort of person want to publish. And yet it was so perfect. Yes. And because of how he found her and all the reasons why it's not necessarily provocative, it's all part of the story and of what happened to her and why she's dreaming about these things. So I, I was just, that cover is so perfect. And I think it's beautiful too. Um, tell us how this came to be. Like were dragons an interest of yours or how, how did this book start? It was actually a dream. <laughs> really? It was a dream I had about 30 years ago. And at that time I had been writing a lot. So I wrote the story as a short story and um, put all my writing aside when I went through my divorce. And when I started writing again, uh, I re resurrected all of my old stories and this was one of them. And it just developed into a larger story into a whole book, but it started out as a dream. That is fascinating because it's so dependent on the dream. So were you actually dreaming about these dragons? Mm -hmm. Okay, that is so yes. cool. And one of the things that strikes me about this whole book, and again, because I published it, you know, I know this book quite well, and in fact, I've probably read several variations, but I think that most books are kind of either they're a light or they're more serious and dark. And yours really mixes these elements as we're going to see, especially in the, the next two scenes you'll read. Why do you think more authors don't mix that light and dark like that? Well, I think part of the mixing for us comes from the fact that we're both writing it because the darkness, I think, comes more from my 
being and the comedy, Mike being a comedian, he brought that in. So I think it's a it's a kind of like a measuring of mesh meshing of uh, ourselves. You know, well, and I, I like it because I think it's very true to life. And you know, as much as I may like many other books. Um, this is part of what I think is a little distinct about mine is that Sean is very funny and witty and sarcastic and irreverent, and yet they're very, very serious and, you know, even bloody and gory things happen because yeah. he's in the middle of a war, and I think that's true to life. So I really like that. And uh, I think this is a perfect opportunity, Michael. You're a comedian. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's about your geriatric Elvis impressions in Las Vegas. Yes, yes. Well, it's, uh, you know, uh, an idea came. I'm, I'm a big Elvis fan. And um, uh, uh, actually, I was listening. This is back in the 90s. I was listening to you know, Elvis all day. Was I used to be a FedEx courier. Listening to um, All Shook Up. My hands are shaking. My knees are weak. Right. So and I was thinking about it. there were so many impersonators after Elvis died. Right. I mean, and um, a lot of these impersonators were getting kind of long in the tooth themselves so mm -hmm. anyway just i you know so I was, originally i was just making fun of these impersonators anyway so geriatric king was in, you know came along i i started parroting his songs geriatric rock are you lucid tonight things of that nature um and yeah so and so i i got a white elvis wig a gold walker and a jumpsuit and I got an oxygen mask behind the cape and so you know i you know i you know i do um uh the old folks' homes and places on the strip and stuff like that, wherever I, wherever I can get booked. Um, I do also stand-up comedy and um, uh, uh, movies. I, I, I've been doing some... Uh, actually, the Elvis character's been in a lot of different small, short films, and cool. yeah, uh, and that's been a lot of fun. And, you know, the <laughs> films have gone on to win awards and things, so... Congratulations. Do you write your own parodies, then? Yeah, yes, yeah. So do you play the music, too? Well, the the great I just usually I just take the karaoke type music. I did I did um, back in Illinois. I paid uh, big money to have a a CD made, mm -hmm. um, and then the, it didn't survive the move <laughs> when we came out here. Yeah, so uh, so I haven't reinvested the money. Yeah, you know I'm saying uh, you know because the backgrounds singers don't sing what I sing, obviously, you know. But, I, you know, I, I just basically need the instrumentals, you know, so. Uh, but I, the great thing about the act is I'll do other songs. I'll do, you know, I'll do a number of songs just actually singing. And, and you know, mm -hmm. and so and then I'll mix in the parodies with some jokes and stuff like that. So it's, it's, a, it's a whole show. It's all, you know, a whole. And, uh, Let's go on to beer number two. All right. Okay. Uh, moving on to beer number two for this next reading. <clears throat> uh, Laura. V, you know that sometimes uh, I don't you I don't pair beer, I pair something else. I've done cocktails, I've done cider, and the like. Um, I bet I know what you're picking this time. Yes, yeah, so this one this one is one of those instances where it is not a beer. And my approach to this was based on uh, the character of the naked young woman that was found on the beach. Yes. Um, and in reading this piece, she strike, strikes me as such a complete blank slate. Mm -hmm. um, like just complete blank slate. Uh, and yet in this reading, she's really light and bubbly and uh, kind of fun. Yeah. And so I was looking for something that is the most blank slate that you could possibly get. And so I chose alcoholic seltzer. <laughs> So it is a thing that in and of itself tastes like nothing. Uh, and so you add flavors to it. And I looked for, I, I tried to pick what is the lightest, most bubbly kind of refreshing flavor, uh, which what I found was lime. So this is oh, a yeah. uh, gray duck. Uh, there's nothing on this can that says where this is made, but since it's gray duck, it has to be Minnesota because <laughs> here they do duck duck gray duck. duck instead of duck duck goose who knows i'm not from minnesota it's strange to me too okay um, i grew up in the military and even though my family's from here yeah i can't get over that what the gray duck and stuff so this is it's just uh lime alcoholic seltzer all right 
Cheers. To represent M, that's the name of the character. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. and that's the, that's the name that uh, Henry uh, Henry gives her because she, you know, he, she doesn't even know who she is. So, um, uh, what do you Henry, think of this, uh, Laura B? I expected, I expected more uh, bubbliness, like you know, fizz when I actually drank it. It kind of fizzed up when I poured it. Yeah. Um, there is yeah. some. See what I would it's, say. This, I, this particular one isn't isn't particularly fizzy. I like your reasons for picking this, and it did fizz up, and it was light and bubbly. But when I drink it, there's a blandness to it. And even yeah, there is. Uh, it, conceptually, it works. <laughs> <laughs> Anne to me is not bland. She's bland. No, no, no. Con like I said, conceptually, bland. the pairing works. Actual. Actually, it works. perhaps not, but conceptually it works. And yeah. since this is a conceptual exercise anyway. <laughs> yeah. and, and I think that you could also further this conceptualization by saying there's a bland taste to it, but you could add so much to it. And we're going to see that. You can. you can add anything you want to this. Cheers. Okay, go ahead with the reading number two. Well, that's interesting you should say that because um, when Lori had me read this book, um, that's exactly what ended up happening. I read these characters and, um, uh, and I just kind of started adding little comments or dialogue and stuff and she loved what I did. And one of the things I, I loved doing was torturing this poor Henry character. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, as you're about to see. And, um, and uh, uh, I love the dynamic between, I help create you know between Hen uh, Henry and his sister um, mm -hmm. uh, Heidi and then also what you're about to see here so that's what I enjoy doing so that was funny you you, you you mentioned adding that so all right here goes noticing Anne's mood hadn't improved he said let's go look at some clothes hoping to distract her we'll come back to the food Anne followed Henry to the woman's department letting Anne push the car seemed to brighten her disposition shopping in the woman's section was no easier. Anne's shopping gene kicked into high gear and she was drawn to the racks of clothes like the proverbial moth to a flame. She darted from rack to rack, snatching up several different items, asking Henry what each one was called. She seemed puzzled over several of his answers, expensive. <laughs> Henry told her, finally told her to stop, picked out a few things in her size, according to Heidi's instructions, and told her to try them on. He didn't stop to think <clears throat> that <clears throat> he, uh, she wouldn't know where to go to change. He quickly stopped her before she stripped out in the middle of the store. Anne, he said in a low voice, stopping her from removing her shirt just in time. He didn't know if he should laugh or run out of the store. You can try them on in the fitting room. With all the clothes picked out and the few remaining food items selected, one task remained taking care of Anne's monthly needs. Henry sighed and took the list out of his pocket uh, his sister had prepared the night before. Anne was strangely quiet. Henry tried to shop casually and not draw attention to himself. Clearly out of his element, Henry struggled to make sense of a never-ending barrage of feminine products. Super absorbent this, ultra thin that, super long with wings. Wings? What the hell are the wings for? Deodorant, overnight, maxi, douching, yeast infection, vaginal discharge. You never never knew it was so tough to be a woman. I'll never complain about jock itch again. This is seriously messed up. <laughs> Henry was about to give up and head to sporty goods, buy in fishing, some fishing waders and just holds her down in the morning. Thankfully, a store clock stocking a nearby shelf took pity on him. Can I help you, sir? The young girl asked politely. Oh, heavens, yes, please. Henry looked at her name tag. Yes, please, Darla, if you don't mind. Henry handed her the list. This is what I need and lots of it because I want to stock up. I mean, she, she, she wants to stock up. Darla looked at Anne. Anne smiled back, looking Darla straight in the eye and pointed to Henry, stating, he has a penis. Darla didn't know what to say. She slowly uttered, yeah, okay. Henry's mind was back in sporting goods. He thought of his thoughts were of loading the largest pistol they had and ending his misery. 
I'm sorry, you, you must forget my friend. Uh, she's not from around here and she's, well, she's special. Oh, I see, okay, no problem, Dollar replied awkwardly. Let's get you taken care of. Henry hated using the word special because Darla would take it exactly the way Darla took it. And of course, really was special, but in a way only Henry understood. Doyle put it out, pointed out where everything on the list was, and soon their cart was packed with enough product for an entire sorority. Henry thanked Darla over and over and made Anne push the cart out of that aisle. Finally, they had come, had all they had come for and headed to the register. Henry emptied the cart onto the belt at the checkout line and pointed to each newly discovered prize and announced his name in loud, clear, loud and clear to the checkers. When Ann said, Super Maxi with wings, the poor guy did his best not to laugh and had a hard time keeping his eyes on his work and not on Ann. Henry started to push the cart out of the store, but Ann hip-checked him out of the way and ran <clears throat> with the cart to the car with the excitement of a child with a new toy. Henry regretted buying her those tennis shoes and was barely able to stop her before she hit the car. Ann watched Henry load everything into the back impatiently. Back home, Henry unloaded the groceries and and Anne dashed inside with the new new clothes. Anne was in the kitchen taking stock of her haul and showing everything off to the animals gathered around, around her. This is a blouse, this is a tank top, and this is an expensive. I love this scene because we see so much of Anne's personality and character in it. And yes, in a way, she's a blank slate, and yet her personality is strong. Mm -hmm. And she's so positive and happy about everything. And just to put this in context, Tanner, Henry has, what, like 10 cats and dogs? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah he's, he's really retreated into all these animals that he takes care of. And I think there's like a dog with three legs or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was paralyzed back legs. Okay. And, and it's on a <laughs> cart or something. And he's really poured himself into taking care of these dogs. And that kind of comes into one of the questions I'll bring up in a minute. But um, here's Anne. She's so just like Michael said, she's bubbly. She's enthusiastic. <laughs> you ran the danger of really making her a Pollyanna. And in fact, Michael, I was curious, you know, since you brought this up that she's so bubbly. And I mean, Michael, Michael Agnew, um, what did you think of Anne's character from this reading? Did, did you find her like? overly Pollyanna or did you like her? Did you what what was your reaction to her character? I don't know. In in this particular reading, I thought it was fun. Okay. Um, but it did strike me there's a danger that it could go to the Pollyanna. Okay. But in yep. the, in what we get in this reading, uh, uh, it was fun. Yeah. So but we're kind of on the same wave wavelength and you know Michael and Lori, I think you managed to avoid that and make her likable when she could have just turned into this like kind of one-dimensional Pollyanna and I'm curious was that something you worked at at making her just this eternal optimist and yet believable and likable or did it do you feel it came just naturally or did you try to really make that happen? I, I think that we tried um, because I knew I didn't want to make her too like you said, Pollyanna, but at the same time, who she is, she's going to look at the world with that innocence mm -hmm. um, and that positivity because she hasn't had time. But that's why we bring out the dark side of the dreams, you know, mm -hmm. and how that affects her, you know, when she starts to draw and draws through the paper because the anger is so, the fear is so strong. So uh, I think we, we did try to bring more um depth into her and and like one of the things i deliberately did is have has a scene where she gets drunk because i wanted to show her falling and having you know human failures right well, for me as an author i the interesting thing for me and i, I the author part for me is is new um, um and uh uh it's the fact that as an author we knew more about the character than the character did Mm -hmm. We knew we knew who she was, and she didn't know. You know, what I mean, you know, there was a lot more to this to her that she hasn't. And so we're helping her find this. You know, so we know there's a lot more to her, and and she just has to 
to uncover. So we're like Henry. We're hel we're helping drag that out of her because we know it's there. So mm -hmm. so we know she's not not that one dimensional. So do you think that that's part of what makes the difference in having this person who can be so bubbly, cheerful, optimistic, and happy all the time? And in a lot of ways, she really is throughout the book, and yet she doesn't come across. Do you think that's part of what helps that? By by having this darker side, I do. Yeah, do yeah. So, I mean, you know, she gets because um, she's crying, and she, she gets up, she's upset, and she gets and and she and she gets angry. She gets angry at Henry a lot, you know. So yeah. you know, so um, yeah. No, uh, so, it's, it's it was more like a, a childlike wonder is what we were trying to do, as as opposed to you know childlike. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think you managed it. Henry is very much the opposite of Anne. He saved her on the beach, and we're going to see in the third scene that he saves her in a very much more profound way, at least we see the beginning of that. Um, but really, she's saving him, too. So can you tell your potential readers a, a little bit about his background and where Anne is taking him? Well, Henry um, was... A typical young man uh, fell in love in high school. Uh, he went into his mother died, and then uh, he got angry because his mom died. So he went into the Navy. His girlfriend went into law school, and uh, they were engaged. Mm -hmm. And during the time that he was deployed, when he came back, he was going to propose to her, and she was killed in an accident on the way back. And then after that, his father died. So he became very angry and turned to a lot of abuse and trying to bury his... Now by abuse, you mean like what, drinking? Drinking and, and women and acting out. acting out. And it wasn't until he found himself in the hospital with a broken skull and his sister looking at him saying, you know, crying that he realized he had to stop that. So his way of dealing with it is he went back to school, got his degree in graphic arts because he was an artist, um, and then really wanted to kind of hide away from the world. So he, as we saw, talked about, rescues all these animals because he still has a lot of love, but he's just very angry at God. And he has faith, and right at this point, he oh. feels like God has abandoned him. He's seen death in his deployment. He's seen death with his parents and then with his fiance. It was more than he could handle. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of what gives the realism to your book. So um, just in a very few seconds here, you have some very vivid descriptions and you put some study into your craft. Who have you studied with? As far as the writing or as far as the writing craft? Um, we've studied with a couple of different uh, I, I took uh, James Patterson's online class. Um, I studied with Ted Decker, who's another Christian author. And then we both went through Jerry Jenkins' novel writing class. Okay. I think we're ready for beer number three. Ready for beer number three. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> when I read this reading, I connected for some reason to the place where they are which as far as the reading goes, you don't say where they are. It's not really described even where they are, but something about the, the material in the reading caused me to like create this whole vivid idea of where the space was. Uh, and it, it's dark and it's very loud. <laughs> um, there's just, I don't know what the noise is even, but there's a lot of noise there. Hmm. So I started thinking about, uh, you know, what in beer would suggest noise. And to me, that that is extreme hops. You're not, you're going to hate this beer, Lauren. <laughs> extreme hops. Uh, so I started, I kind of headed towards uh, double IPA. So a strong Indie Pale Ale. Uh, and then, as I was shopping today, I just happened to find one from War Pigs Brewing called Chaos Monger, <laughs> which 
kind of took me to the 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 villain character in the thing who seems to be to be kind of a chaos monger. I just have to interrupt and read this this little blurb on the can here. Yeah, it says uh, the arduous road to hop enlightenment is wrought with chaos. Let the sent uh, let the sentinel chaos monger be your beacon to finding beer of character. Da da da. <laughs> so what's interesting about this, aside from the fact that that's why I, I chose it to, to pair with this, so it was both the beer and the name. Um, so War Pigs is a collaboration project of Mikeller, which is a, a Danish brewery, and Three Floyds in Indiana. But on the can here, it says... Brewed and packaged under supervision of War Pigs USA Brewing LLC, Munster, Indiana, by Summit Brewing Company, St. Paul, Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> and look at these kind of scary looking characters. On oh, the yeah. Yeah, I, I think that fits the scene very, very well. Yes, I do, yeah. too. <laughs> Good choice. All right. I'm, I'm guessing you hate this, Laura. Well, you notice I only poured a very <laughs> working. Well, you know, maybe so. This is a beer that we would in the beer world would describe as dank. Dank. So hops are in the same family as marijuana, and so <laughs> we're, we've started borrowing terminology. And so this is a right. dank beer because there's some definite weed aromas there. Interesting. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, she didn't like that. You <laughs> have foisted on me. I hate this one the worst. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Uh, this is not a beer you're gonna like at all. <laughs> I'm not super crazy about this beer because hops aren't necessarily my thing, but I don't hate it. It looked, it, it looked like <laughs> all for the sake of literature, right? <laughs> I think that's got to be one of your outtakes on the YouTube channel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it looks like you accidentally uh, drank somebody's urine sample. Not even that has to have been like a urine sample from that's one. That's what it looks like. Exactly what it looks like. Something from a very large putrid wild animal. <laughs> Well, well, you do your third reading. I might be rinsing my mouth out. <laughs> I, uh, I way back in the day, now I worked for FedEx. Back in the day, um, I had to do a DOT uh, Department of Transportation physical, and they just had me just go in and, and just use a regular styrofoam cup for the urine sample. So I did that, and I put water. I took another cup. This had cups in here, so I put water in the second cup. So uh -huh. I walk out of the, out of the men's room. I have two cups, and she goes. Oh, we only need the one. They said, oh, okay, I'll put this one back. And I drank it in front of her. And she screamed. <laughs> that's that's, my that's the comedian. So, 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 well, then for the... Anyway, I better get to the reading. Wrong wrong, so. All right. You uh, read away. <laughs> I gotta go. I gotta get serious. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You're insane. Do you want me to read it? It's <laughs> laughing too hard now. All right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Started at least. Where the hell am I? He croaked, finding his throat dry and raw. He heard a reply, but it didn't come from either of the men. Rather, from behind him came a deep, growling voice that didn't quite sound human. You are my guest, Mr. Williford. Who the hell are you? Henry struggled against the chains, but they were too taut to get any movement. Let's just say we have a mutual acquaintance, the voice rumbled. Henry was finding it hard to breathe, stretched out as he was. What? What do you want with Anne? You leave her the hell alone. I'll kill you, I swear. Blondie stood up and punched Henry's stab wound. Henry squeezed his eyes against the agonizing pain. The voice oozed over the room like rancid honey. Patience, my friend. You'll know soon enough. Stan, the black man's look 
make the call. Stan took Henry's cell phone, punched in a number, and moments later, his voice oozed out. Hello, Anne. We met the other night, but you were rude and ran off, remember? Henry's heart froze. Leave her the hell alone, he struggled against his wrist strings. Leave her alone. The voice from behind chuckled. Don't worry, she's an old friend. She'll be surprised to see me again. I don't know why you assholes are doing this. I don't care. Do what you want with me. Just leave her out of it. Stan and the other man laughed. The voice from behind, she's the reason you are here. I could care less about you. Stan, go ahead. Stan held the phone to his ear. Henry could hear Anne screaming into the phone. Who is this? What do you want? Come down, sweetie, Stan said. We got your boy here. If you want to see him alive again, you get into the black car waiting outside. We know where you are. Come alone. Don't tell Heidi you're leaving. There was a pause as Anne spoke, but Henry couldn't make out what she was saying. The Stan put the phone up to Henry. Tell her you're fine, lover boy. She wants to hear your voice. Henry shouted, don't come here, Anne. Call the police. Don't worry about me. Blondie punched him, causing the wound to gush fresh blood. Henry couldn't even double over in response as the change cut into the flesh, restraining him. He rolled his eyes. The room turned red from the pain. Come alone and don't say anything to anybody if you want to find him alive. Be a good girl and get into the black car and everything will be fine. Dan's voice smiled. He ended the call and spoke to the voice in the dark. She's on her way. Then he threw it. Henry's phone on the floor and stomped on it, crushing it. No, Henry whispered, no. The voice in the dark grew closer. Hot air brushed on the, the skin on Henry's back. He turned his head to see the face of the voice in the dark. What do you want with us? All in good time, my friend, he said. All will be revealed in good time, Stan. Ed, let's make our guest comfortable while we wait for my lady. As Henry hung between the poles like a fly laced in a spider's web, he tried to figure out who the mystery voice was. Was this the man from Anne's past? Were the people, the trafficker, Detective Ortega, warned him about? Was this asswipe that Master Thug 1 and Thug 2 were yammering about the other night? This scene to me is the beginning of the real part of this story, which is really a parable um, kind of of Henry's growth, but also the story of selflessness, even to the point of laying down one's life for another. And, and that becomes more clear as the scene goes on. And that's a very Christian theme. And there are uh, discussions of faith in this book, but I don't think you ever intended this to be Christian fiction. So why not? I did, actually. Did you? Okay. I didn't know that because to me it doesn't come across as that. Well, my intention uh, was to write it as a Christian fiction, but because of the darker elements, um, I was, and it actually the first time was published by a Christian publisher and mm -hmm. marketed as Christian fantasy. Uh, but some other people said that it would be better to market as regular rather mm -hmm. than Christian fantasy because of the darker elements in it. Okay, and this brings us to a really interesting story. Now for our um, 50.5 million readers, because you guys are giving such a great interview that we just gained some, um, we actually met in Hawaii just about, well, a little more than a year ago now. It was in August of 2019, right? Mm -hmm. And we had a very interesting discussion. It was really cool because I went to see my son there, and you guys happened to be there for your anniversary. So it was just dumb luck. We were there at the exact same time. But you were telling me a story about this pastor who read your book and asked you never to come back to his church. Yes, you did. Um, I just, I mean, I'm laughing. It's a tragic story. It's, I mean, it's funny in a way because I think he missed the point of your book. Mm -hmm. I think he missed the point because he's looking at these scenes where, um, you know, at the risk of, you know, um, 
a giveaway, uh, you know, I forget what the term is for that. So um, there's there's a scene where she climbs into the shower with Henry. And, you know, as you saw, Michael, from the readings, she's very naive. She's very clueless. She has no concept of what this means. And poor Henry is like, oh, my gosh, here's this beautiful woman in the shower with me. You know, I'm not going to take advantage. So there are some and I, I didn't remember it. Does, do they actually end up sleeping together? I think they do. Yes, they do. Eventually, yeah. Okay, so, you know, here's this guy who's got a little bit of a past, you know, maybe not the worst, but he does have a bit of a past. He's, um, you know, sleeping with this beautiful young woman. He's, um, you know, he's ends up there ends up being some violence. And I know that when I worked on editing this book, we actually talked about toning it down because it was very, very graphic. And, um, which a part of me said, well, you know what, the real world is very graphic. In the real world, you would leave that, and yet you need to sometimes tone it down for readers' tastes. But um, how, how did you feel about this pastor missing the point of your book? You know, it's, really, it's really interesting you should say that, because I literally, literally opened a letter today. It's at my desk, and I'm, I'm going to make an appointment to talk to him about it. About it the same pastor. Yep, yep. We, uh, um, he's. I mean, is he's got a great church, and there's more. There's more to it. So we need to flush okay. it out more. He wants to talk to me about it and so on. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, so it, we're, it's still it's still an ongoing thing. We've been back. We had been back to his church, and he was, you know, of course during the COVID thing. So we're not, a whole, you know, there's not a whole lot of like one-on-one -on -one contact. So, because uh, he's, I mean, it's a good church, you know, um, but mm -hmm. um, anyway, so we're, we're still, we're still working on that, you know, so, um, so I, I think we'll get past it, you know, so I, and I understand, I can understand his point of view, you know what I'm saying, I mean, for goodness sake, so, but, you know, the other, the other say, you know, I mean, Christian people do have sex, so, <laughs> you know, and, and Christians do, do use bad language and, you know, and stuff, you know, yeah. they, you know, so these things, like you said, happen in the real world. The real world is not going to be little house in the prairie, you know, you know, be, you know, the real world is not rated G, you know, so, um, uh, so maybe we need is as authors, maybe, you know, like you're saying, toning things down, maybe we need to find as authors, maybe we need to find a little more middle ground, um, uh, I'm actually been struggling with the sequel on this. I have the whole story mapped out, and um, because uh, Lori um, kind of let, lets the sequel up to me, which I like, but she wrote the first story, so I had that to go by. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. now I, you know, so I've got the uh, second story all flushed out, you know. But I've actually been taking some uh, those 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 great courses. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I've been taking some. Because she's, I'm not a good a writer as she is, like technically. So I've been actually taking some of those courses on my own, so okay. I can hopefully do a better job of writing, so I can articulate better. Because I really don't do a very good job as technically, you know. So, um, uh, so hopefully I can do that. And I'm, I'm kind of taking these characters and having a lot of fun with them, and, um, and I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm more. I, I want to put the characters through through something different uh, and that's all i'm going to say right now they're going to be going back to the dragon world actually so right right yeah. um well one of the things that i found interesting uh michael and because <laughs> we're once again laura laura michael michael <laughs> Lori, laura but um was that you kind of opened the segment with talking about how you're not religious but you're interested in these gnostic yeah. gospels and so for me, when I wrote my book, this was a big thing to me that most books are either secular or they're, you know, Christian fiction, whether that's like, um, I just dropped all my notes here, um, you know, whether that's like whatever branch of Christianity or it could even be any other religion, but books are either one or the other, they're secular or they're faith-based. And to me, that's not realistic. And that's one of the reasons why I didn't even try to um, publish my book traditionally, because it was too, too, it dug too much into faith. 
for a secular publisher, but it was way too secular for a Christian publisher because these people are real. You know, they do all these things that people of faith say you're not supposed to do. Well, you know what? Get over it. Real people do these things. And that was well, that's a, it's a question I had, actually. It's like with the, the idea that the, the dark content might be too much for a Christian to, to market it as a Christian book. Mm-hmm. It's not like the Bible isn't full of some pretty dark content <laughs> exactly. and, <laughs> and sexual content for that matter. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> that that that's what Lori's brave idea. This is what she's trying to do. She's trying to, she's trying to, um, you know, pioneer into that into that unknown that that space there. Yeah. That's 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 her brave idea that she's trying to do, and I just it's amazing. <laughs> My question is, do you think that there will be a growing demand for this? Because to me, to put your characters into one world or the other, let me give you an example. Years ago, I went to this play, you know, that this very um, evangelical Christian friend of mine invited me to. And the whole thing was everybody is invited to say the Jesus prayer, you know, Jesus save me, whatever it is. And um, immediately they all die. <laughs> and they're all, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> That's not realistic. If, you know, if somebody becomes Christian or whatever faith they become, they don't immediately become perfect and run around going, hallelujah, I'm saved. And their lives are forever more perfect and nothing bad ever happens to them again. Like, that's not true, you know? So do you think or do you hope that there's maybe a growing market for books where it's more balanced and truthful? There actually is a very big market because with all of the people that I'm involved with on Facebook, there's several groups of uh, Christians who want to read fantasy and sci-fi. And I've taken surveys of many of them and a lot of them like the darker stuff. Well, mm-hmm. not that's the reviews we got. Right, the reviews, the reviews and and there's people that literally say your book changed my life and that sort of thing. Because like, the, I I absolutely believe there are people like that. You know that um, exactly. You know because they it's not one or the other. You know because it, 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 you know it's like I and like you said if if I you know I believe in God but if, is it wrong for me to also like this? You know so if they can have best of both worlds you know well, there's also like i said one of my teachers is ted decker who writes very very dark christian fiction and mm-hmm. i asked him about it and he he said he in his lessons he says you got to get the dark out because yeah. otherwise it's going to stay in there and you got to get it out and jerry jenkins himself told us he says you can go as dark as the bible and as michael said the bible is full of dark. sex and murder and, and- and And so i'm finding all these christians online that are hungry for this type of story and i think the light shines a lot brighter when you know the darker the dark is the light shines a lot brighter and like i said i think it's so unrealistic to say that oh i'm saved now my life is perfect and then when people think they're saved and life is still horrible what does that do so we, we need to wrap up. So I am at lauravosica.com. My new website is up and running. Michael, where are you? I am at uh, aperfectpint.net. Uh, and where are you, Lori and Mike? We are at, uh, my my website is um, loretakehoe.com. And we have right? No, we don't yet. Okay. And uh, I'm at mikekentertainment.com. So... Fantastic. And uh, coming up next month, Dr. Christopher R. Powell is an author, poet, musician, engineering and management consultant and aspiring polymath with his fingers on everything from fretboards and ivories to the pulse of postmodernism, surrealism and nihilism's impact on the destruction of morality and sanity. That's nice. Uh, his His work takes him from the internet of things to cyberspace and from supercomputers to AI. More down to earth, he putters in his labs with birdhouses and cameras, servo, motor, servo motors, and drones. At the range, he's comfortable with ARs and lasers, in a kilt with trombones and guitars, and in the kitchen making omelets and Long Island iced teas for his love. <laughs> Powell's book, 
has been described by Kirkus Reviews as having certain similarities to Joan Didion's 2005 book, The Year of Magical Thinking, which investigated the nature of grief. But Dr. Powell's book investigates the nature of illness itself. He meticulously details his late wife, Bonnie's every procedure and symptom and every failure of modern medicine to provide her with relief. He also applies the same method to his own emotions and spirituality, presenting engaging, admirably honest deductions regarding sacrifice and dedication in this powerful, heartbreaking memoir. So he is actually sort of our Valentine special. His readings will all be focusing on love as his, uh, his interview will come out in February. Wonderful. And I'm just going to repeat what I said, I think, last week, that nothing good ever came from the Long Island Ice Cube. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fighting words, I'll tell you. <laughs> hours of teaching online um, is killing my throat, and <laughs> and they make me happy. <laughs> so, uh, Lori and Mike, uh, thank you for joining us and reading your lovely material. And... Uh, this has been Books and Brews, episode 21. Thanks for joining us and cheers. Thank cheers. you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>